What does it mean to build green? Our next guest here is going to clarify that question for us for now in the future, and he's bringing the, light, the lessons of a lifetime plus his most up-to-date developments on it. He is the Emmy Award-winning former host of This Old House. He's an experienced home renovator, and he's the host of Renovation Nation on Planet Green. Please welcome Steve Thomas. Thank you very much. One of the films we did for the History Channel was on the Apollo space program, which of course put a man on the moon. And in the course of doing the film, we met the guys who were on the moon. Gene Cernan driving the lunar rover here, Buzz Aldrin, who was on the moon before he was dancing with the stars, and Gene Krantz, who is popular for the phrase, failure is not an option. All of these guys knew that they stood astride a moment in history that probably would not be repeated. Certainly, they may never have the chance again to stand on another planet. But they understood the magnitude of the enterprise, the force of will it took to build the machines and put the program together, and the incredible human effort and will that went into putting a man on the moon. I held the boot that made this footprint. And as I turned the boot over, I noticed there was still dust on the bottom. And I reached over, and I touched the dust. And the curator of the museum in which these spacesuits reside looked at me and said, yes, it's moon dust. And the hair stood up on the back of my head. These photographs had never been taken before. Earthrise Apollo 8, 1968, first time you'd seen a picture of the Earth rising over the moon. Shift directions, and you see the Earth in the foreground, the moon in the background. Carl Sagan said, let's turn the Voyager around and see what the Earth looks like from four billion miles away. It's a tiny blue dot, just one little blue-green dot amidst a sea, an infinity of no life. So that is the game. That's the grand, the grand game that we play right now as we are human beings on the face of the Earth. I happen to have seen a significant part of the blue-green Earth from the deck of a sailboat. After college, I raced out to Hawaii, sailed the boat back, Spent a year in the Med as first mate of a 103-foot schooner. Took a 43-foot sloop from England to San Francisco, down through the Panama Canal, Galapagos, Marquesas, up to Hawaii, back across to San Francisco. That got me pretty much through the 1970s, never having a real job, which I kind of liked. So off to the Pacific I went to study traditional Micronesian navigation. Mao Pialig was the most known master of this dying art, the Polynesians once practiced these techniques to get them across the Pacific, and they are still practiced on six little islands in the middle of the Pacific. Off I went. I became adopted by this guy, Puitok, who is Mao's adopted father. I was taught secrets that had never been taught to another Westerner. And I spent 83 and 84, two long field work seasons, studying with the navigators of Micronesia, wrote a book called The Last Navigator, returned again in 87 and 88, and shot a film for public television's adventure series in which we went from Sadawal to Saipan, 500 miles using stars, waves, and birds. Pialig recently died, and he was honored in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, uh, LA Times, as a world citizen. He understood that if he didn't teach his skills to anybody, white guy, Micronesian, didn't matter, that something would die. A moment in history, in the intellectual history of humanity, would not survive. And I was privileged to be there at that time, at that place, because now it's not repeatable. The guys are dead. The culture has changed. Next project was in the Arctic. My grandfather was a missionary in Point Hope, Alaska. My father was born there. My grandmother was no shrinking violet. Here she is on her dog sled. And he was an avid amateur photographer, took some extraordinary photographs which I'm proud to say will be headed to the University of Alaska in the next couple of weeks. He spent a lot of time out on the sea ice with his friend Sam Rock. When I went back, I spent a lot of time with the Rock clan out on the sea ice. And this was the first year, so this is 1988. It was the first year the sea captain, the whaling captain said, there's something different in the ice. And that stuck in my head, because it was a long time ago. The other side of life has always been renovating houses. Uh, we owned this house for 24 years. It's a first period colonial. 
in Salem, Massachusetts. It didn't look like this when we started. It looked more like this. Uh, my dad was a renovator. Uh, the apple did not far, fall far from the tree. I can tell you there are three very expensive words in renovation, which is might as well, or four while we're at it. And there's, <laughs> right? Hey, honey, while we're at it, we might as well. And then you're into it for another 15 or 20,000 bucks. We own this house for 24 years, which is the longest I've ever lived anywhere. It's a, it was a, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful house. We raised our son there. And I used it as a test bed for a lot of energy savings tech, techniques. I did a program for the, uh, for the Energy Star program. The challenge was how much waste can we take out of this house? So through a variety of techniques from insulation, air sealing, energy efficient appliances, we took this leaky old colonial and took 28% of the energy use out of it for heating and cooling. So you scale that up and you start to make some great gains. 14 years on this old house. This old house, of course, is about renovating old houses. First project I did was a barn in Concord, Massachusetts. It had been let go, water got to it, so we ended up tearing it down. You can see in this shot, the beams just shatter, powder post beetle dust flies out of the inside of the beams. There was nothing worth saving. Built a new timber frame right on site, raised it in the traditional way, so the core of the building is very traditional. We wrapped it in structural insulated panel. We had a heat recovery ventilator, high-tech heating system, so on and so forth. So 1989, this is a very green building. The term didn't exist. We called it sustainable building. Now, did another series of films for the History Channel on the veterans. And this is about stepping up to the plate. Uh, we put these guys back on a B-25. The guy in the upper right uh, is Dick Cole. He was uh, co-pilot on uh, the uh, Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. The guy in the upper left spent, got shot down in the Pacific on a B-25 and spent the war in a prisoner of war camp. He said, I don't know if I want to get back on that airplane. I didn't have very good luck the first time. But he did. And when you realize when you hang out with these guys, you know, drink a martini with them at night, is they did what they had to do. In fact, they said, you know, we had a job to do. We had to fight the Germans. We had to fight the Japanese. It's what we had to do. We went and did what we had to do. This guy, Dean Gallus, we took back to Attu Island. Coast Guard flew us out on a C-130. We put him back on the beach on which he had fought as an 18-year-old kid. It was a very difficult, bloody battle, second only to Okinawa. And again, these guys just say, we did what we had to do. They knew that they stood astride a moment in history, and they had to step up to the plate. And I came away from these two films having tremendous admiration for these guys. They don't talk about it much. They finally had the opportunity late in life to, to talk about it, and they did to us. And it was a great privilege to be able to do that. So back to the Arctic. Summer sea ice, 1979. I was there in 89. This is summer sea ice, 2003. OK? Whaling captains were right. The ice was changing. You put it on a graph, ice is, ice is diminishing. You look at the temperature, temperature is rising. Uh, CO2, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is going up. Has this happened before? Yeah, it has. Over geologic time, it's happened before. This goes back 400,000 years. The Earth wasn't a pretty place when the temperatures were high. So my view is, to the extent that we in our building systems, our built environment, are pushing the biosphere into a tipping point of some sort or other, then we have some ethical responsibility to change our behavior. What's interesting is that it doesn't matter because energy is going to be the big choke point. Increase in world energy consumption. It's going up. We all know that. Expressed in oil, North America, Europe. It's going up. Gas, North America, Europe. Consumption will go up. It's inevitable. And so therefore, that is my current focus, is energy. Because to me, that is going to be the choke point. From my point of view, as a built environment guy, building operations consume 76% of the electricity out there. Huh, wow. If we could take 30% of the waste out of it, that's pretty big. Expressed in overall energy consumption, it's 48%. So the opportunities for efficiency are huge. So into this mix steps Planet Green. Three years ago, launches a 24-7 green channel. Why don't you do a show called Renovation Nation? Sure. Go all over the country taking a look at green housing. This house is in Houston. 
and it is uh, a super greenhouse. It produces more energy than it uses, collects water, geothermal, heating and cooling, all kinds of stuff. The people who built it are politically extremely conservative. I said, so what's the deal? You guys are really conservative, and you're building the greenest house in Houston. And they looked at me like I was a moron, and they said, we're conservative. We conserve. <laughs> I was like, uh, duh. So then I thought, well, there's a whole class of green building that can be expressed in terms of conservation, of conservatism, in the old-fashioned word of not using as much. These folks are retiring to Albuquerque because their kids live there from Boston. Uh, they wanted to build a house that capped their energy costs. They built a greenhouse. Actus Lend Lease builds housing for the military on military bases all over the place. This happens to be in Honolulu. They own the homes, uh, the complexes. They lease them back to military personnel. And they own them for 50 years. And they got to maintain them for 50 years. And so they said the cheapest way to build a, a, a building and maintain it over 50 years is to use green building techniques, conservatism. And then you've got Habitat for Humanity. This happens to be in Detroit, but it's done nationwide. They figured out about eight years ago that it's really unfair to sell somebody that can barely afford a house a house that they can't then afford to heat and cool. So they have switched their building techniques to super efficient construction. They might not be pretty, but they are very efficient. So those are the conservatives. The most fun group that I worked with on Renovation Nation was the Gen Y enthusiasts, kids in their 20s, my son's age. No problem is too big. They're going to solve it. Polar ice caps melting, no problem, we'll figure it out. Polar bears need a new home, we'll adopt one, whatever it is. It's like, we'll get it done. And it was just a blast to deal with this group. These two kids are building the greenest house in Portland. They're recycling their poop. They're recycling their water. They're growing food on the roof. They're growing food in the backyard. They're not using trucks. They're riding bicycles around to get their materials. It was a blast working with them. This guy in Seattle bought a wreck of a house that should have been torn down. He's going to renovate it. He's going to restore it. Got it. We got it. Pro you know, and what's interesting about this group is that they'll actually listen to you. So you got any good advice? OK, cool. Yeah, great idea. I'll take that one. So it's a very, very interesting demographic group. These guys in Portland wanted to build a house using the most recycled, reclaimed, or rejected material they possibly could. So Craigslist. Odd, odd job lots, rejects that they resaw and stuff like that. 85% of the materials that went into this house were recycled, reclaimed, rejected. So that's Gen Y. Then you've got, it's more of a Gen X thing. Uh, they're lifestylers. They've decided we're going to live on a carbon budget. Guy on the right is a German uh, chemist. His mom's in the middle. His wife is a Indian physician and practitioner of Ayurvedic medicine. They wanted to build a house to raise their family in that would be healthy and that would save enough carbon so they could fly back to Germany and fly back to India and be on some sort of a carbon budget. So it's a lifestyle choice. That's what they do. That's the way it is. This is the way we live. Then you've got a group called the mad scientist or simply the nuts. This guy builds tree houses. He cashes in his trust fund checks for a living, but he builds tree houses. And he's got this idea of people living in trees, descending to the forest floor to farm and do whatever, and then I guess jumping in their Priuses to go off to work. I didn't really get it, but somehow in the mania, there was the germ of a good idea there. This guy is outside of Austin. He spent his life savings building this array that collects solar energy, so we're talking solar thermal here, heat from the sun, stores it in the earth, and then pumps it back into the house. Not a bad idea. He must have had a very tolerant wife because he spent a fortune on this thing. So there are mad scientists out there that are coming up with the next innovation. We don't know what it is, but they're coming up with it. So out of all this, what is green building? So I came up with this diagram, this, the five rings of green. Energy, workmanship, materials, health, and design. Energy is the energy that it takes to run a building. The more conservative you are in building it through the various techniques, the less energy it takes. Workmanship is the sum total of details that go into the build quality of the building. The old guys knew how to build buildings in New England that would last literally for centuries. Uh, some of the newer houses, because they're not detailed very well, fall apart quickly. Materials is the sum total of the, the cost in carbon or whatever of 
mining, logging, transporting, processing, manufacturing, all the things in the supply chain. And some of the big box stores like uh, Depot and Lowe's have started to greenify their supply chain. And with 2,000, 2,500 stock keeping units, it's a big job. Health is a huge bubble. That is indoor air quality, off-gassing of materials, uh, and all of those issues that go into the health of the building. Typically, the men are interested in energy, and the women are interested in the health of the building. That's how it breaks out demographically. Finally, you've got design. That's what ties them all together, builds a building that's appropriate for its use, appropriate for the neighborhood, and so on. So how does this play out in my own little life here? Well, recently, well, 10 years ago, we bought a rundown house on an island in Maine. And I renovated it. We said, hey, it's on an island, so you got to get there in your own boat. But being on an island is where you take all the silly pictures, you view all the beautiful sunsets. The house was a dog. So I thought, might as well take a look at some new designs. This one seemed simple. I could build that pretty easily, put it in the computer. Got gigantic. Went back to the drawing board. This one I could build pretty easily, put it in the computer. Got gigantic. OK, let's just renovate the one we've got. I knew this would be a process of turning a sow's ear into a silk purse, and I was right. It was a fight to the finish. There was not much left of the original building. You can see here the building takes shape in the background. Transport to an island is an unbelievable hassle. Big barge here, medium-sized barge here, work boat with a float on it here. A lot of the materials we just put in the back of my dump truck, schlepped them up the hill, and built the house. Was it worth it? It's very interesting because when I finished it, all, this is a small fishing community on the coast of Maine. And they said, wow, you kept the old house. You didn't do what most people do, which is to build this gigantic house. So now I realize there is a sixth ring, which is connectivity, connecting to your community, connecting to your neighbors, connecting to your architectural past, and so on. Now, Planet Green said, wow, it's really too bad that you don't have a project that you can build on the air because we want to film it. So my buddy, Ben Brungraber, who doesn't always wear a dress, but he only wears a dress for special occasions like barn raisings, and I had tr dreamed up this project for a Usonian barn, something that would be super green, but green in a different way. So the idea was we're going to log all the materials from about a 20-mile radius. We're going to put them together in this workshop as a timber frame, transport them to the port, get them over to the island on a variety of barges. We're going to put it up in sections, so you had to get it all up the hill, up to the site, and we're going to put it together in three days. So the walls go on, the timber frame core goes in, south wall goes on here, more of the timber frame core. By the end of day one, we had the first floor, floor platform. Day two, gable end, timber frame core. Cheek walls go on here, rafters go on here, more rafters here, end of day two, day three, structural insulated paneling goes on, by the end of day three, this is what we had. Took a little longer than that to finish it out, but now you've got a building that is mostly local materials, mostly local built, transported the minimum distance, uh, will last, it'll be there 100 years from now, is sympathetic with the neighborhood, plus it was a blast to build. So at a certain point in all of our lives, we start to think, you know, what's our legacy? Where are we going? And at this point, we stand astride a moment in history. Another way to take a look at the building green game is conservation's on the bottom. That's easy to do. You turn off the lights. You use less. Efficiency is in the middle. You get better appliances, more energy efficient boilers, air conditioners, that kind of stuff. I used to have on the top of this pyramid renewables, wind, solar, that kind of stuff. And then I said, no, it's really about innovation, because where we have to go is to game-changing technologies. We have to think about building with bamboo building with mud, generating electricity in new ways. We're headed to a world with 9 billion people. And they don't want to live in grass huts anymore. And they won't. So we need to think about changing the game. So when it comes down to it, it's all about innovation. And that's where we're headed. Besides, let's just put this in perspective. We've got one Earth. Take a look at the moon. There's no life on it. And zoom back out to the blue-green blue dot, and it's all we've got. And there's nothing else with life on it. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Steve, thank you. Do I look like Dr. Eagleman? <laughs> yeah.
Perception or reality, it's more expensive to build green? It's more expensive to build green depending on how you do the accounting. You want to elaborate on that? You want me to elaborate on that? You got 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds, fine. Actus Lendlease is not going to do anything that affects the bottom line. They have to own these buildings for 50 years. They figured out if they build green, they're going to lower their maintenance, they're going to lower their operating costs in terms of energy in, energy out. They're going to lower their, lower their maintenance costs. And as important as anything else, the US military personnel is given a stipend. They can go rent a place anywhere in Honolulu, wherever the heck they want to. So they can build a better house, pay for it over time, and make money by going green. So, like I say, it's how you do the accounting. Gotcha. So we talked earlier. What's ahead for Steve Thomas? I think the big issue, you know, as I look over the whole thing, there's a whole bunch of issues, and they're all important. But I always come back to energy, because if we need to find, um, not necessarily carbon neutral, but let's just leave it really general, environmentally neutral ways to generate power. We need a lot more power. So we're going to have to innovate our way into more power. Maybe it's big offshore wind installations. Maybe it's uh, a super grid. Uh, it's going to be a combination of conservation, of efficiency, and then innovation. And I'd like to, in the next 10 years, we're going to set the stage for what's going to happen to our planet in the next 50, 100 years. And I'd like to be part of that decision-making process because from what I've seen of the blue-green Earth, it's a pretty cool place. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.